tuned in to the Community Cast podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Sarah Brown. Sarah has studied and worked with cats for over 30 years and has just written a new book, The Hidden Language of Cats, How They Have Us at Meow, that was published in October of 2023. Her career with cats began back in the 1980s when she embarked on a doctorate studying the behavior of neutered domestic cats. These studies focused on two colonies of feral cats, recording the behavior of the cats within each colony. One of the colonies was rescued from a school, neutered, and relocated at a new location that they found for them. And then since completing her PhD, She has worked as a cat behavior counselor, as a consultant for the cat toy industry, and as an author of cat books. She's also worked and volunteered in rescue shelters, something she enjoys immensely, helping look after the cats and find them the right new owners, as well as fostering mother cats and their kittens in her own home. Sarah, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. So first and foremost, there was a bit in that bio, but Tell us, what is it that really made you passionate about cats? Oh, gosh, long story. I've always loved cats and dogs and animals of all sorts, right, from when I was a little girl. And so that led me to study zoology at university. And there, when I was studying, I I loved the animal behavior side of it and decided that that was the way I wanted to go. I wanted to study animals and what they do. And then I got really lucky out of university and managed to get a place working with Dr. John Bradshaw at the newly formed Anthrozoology Institute in Southampton University, which is in England. And there we studied cats and dogs. And I was able to do a PhD part-time on whatever I wanted. So I thought, you know what, these cats look really interesting. And I loved cats. So that's what I did. And it all went from there, really. So what is it about feline behavior that attracted you, you know, I have an aha moment. I share this with our listeners often. You know, I saw a dumpster full of all these kittens and I just said, oh, these kittens in many cases, they shouldn't have even been born, you know? So I became, you know, a spay neuter fiend really, which is, you know, trying to make sure that everybody has access to affordable, accessible spay neuter, helping community cats, managing colonies, folks that are out there. And, you know, feline behavior is a huge component of that ecosystem that supports community cats. But it sounds like you've played a bit of a role in everything, but you've really zoned in on feline behavior. Am I correct? Yes, definitely. I mean, that's what I studied from the outset in these colonies that I was looking at. I was very interested in how they use their behavior on a day-to-day basis. And I've always felt a bit like cats were a bit left behind in the animal behavior study world and dogs get so much attention in terms of their amazing behavior, which it is, but cats get described as cool and aloof and uncommunicative and I always felt that was a bit harsh and so I sort of, you know, I wanted to, that's partly why I wrote this book is that I wanted to raise the profile of cats and their behavior and and show people just how much they have got to say for themselves. So let's first talk about your experience looking at those colonies back, I think you said in the 80s or the 90s. I don't <laughs> time ago. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you learned, what you saw. Tell us, you know, the feline behavior of colonies. And I'd love to hear more about the colony that you ended up relocating to. Okay. So, well, to start then maybe with how I found the colonies. So that I studied two colonies. One was already established. It lived in the grounds of a really big hospital in the middle of the countryside. And it's an old Victorian hospital, huge grounds and lots of places to hide. And the cats had originally come and and (laughs) were still coming because people dumped their pet cats there when they didn't want them. And they inevitably bred. And as generations proceeded, some of them became more feral. Then attempts were made to neuter them and, and put them back So there was a very mixed population of neutered ferals and newly dumped cats there. So I found a little group of very ferals that I studied there in in amongst all these other cats. 
And then the second colony was one that I heard about that was living under the buildings of a school, like a local school. And the headmaster and the teachers were obviously getting a bit fed up with the, you know, with the mess and the disruption. So they called in a local animal rescue. And with their help, we rescued these cats and they got them neutered, spayed, treated them for all their illnesses, you know, everything. And then they rehomed the kittens that were born in the shelter. And then the adults that were left who were too feral to rehome, then relocated on a farm that we were very lucky to get, you know, permission to put them on. We formed the colony there and I watched them there for a, a year or so. So one question I get all the time with regards to relocation is, is it really successful? So in your experience with an N of one, Uh, you know, sample (laughs) size of one, was it successful? Did all the cats stick around? So, yeah, obviously I was very naive and young and this was right at the beginning of trap neuter type projects. And so, yeah, I was learning as we went. So we put back 11 cats and Over the time that I studied them, two of them disappeared. This was right next to some woods, so it was very hard to actually, you know, keep proper track of them. But they all stayed around initially, and they were all very much part of that colony, and their behavior is all included in what I noted. I always think of it as a success. There was one particular cat in this colony that became what I describe as a bit of a poster boy for the, you know, trap neutering campaign, because he was called Sid, and he was the skinniest, saddest young male of the colony and so he was all very you know hard done by when we picked him up and before and an after photo of Sid and Sid a year later looks you know filled out you know nice coat content and it was just such a great thing he was in magazines and things and it was sweet so I think of it as a success as much as a beginner project like that can be but for the cats I think it was a great outcome they you know they were living hard life, you know, under old buildings. And then they got to live out their lives on the farm. And it was just nice for them. They got fed every day and, you know, got left alone mostly, apart from me just watching them. So when you did the relocation, did you have them adapt to the areas like stay? Sometimes here in the US, the farms have tack rooms. So we would have the cats stay in a tack room for three to four weeks just to try and reacclimate them. The other thing that I've heard too is trying to get the cats back in the barn at night so that they're not out and sort of threatened by wildlife. Did you have any of those practices? Yes. So we we put up a shed, a big shed on the farm where in the area where you know we wanted them to be, and we kept them in there for the three weeks. I think when we first added on a run, so they weren't just shut in a the shed. They had a you know had a big outdoor space to get used to the area and see where they were and. Then after three weeks, we opened the door and they all disappeared. And then gradually, you know, over the next week or so, they all reappeared and the food disappeared. So we knew. And so what we did was we fed them inside the shed and made just a little cat hole in the shed. So they, you know, they came in to eat. We didn't shut them in at night, but we did put beds in the shed. And then we built an extra sort of little shelter construction next to it with beds in. So basically there was enough room for them all to sleep, you know, warm and in side as time went on. And they, they all used it because we see, I mean, they didn't come in with us, but we could see the hairs <laughs> in the beds, and which was a bit of a giveaway. You know, those ginger hairs, you know, oh, someone's been in here sleeping. <laughs> and nowadays with all of the trail cams, you know, you'd have cameras in there. Absolutely. It would be brilliant now. So that you yeah. could see who's coming in at We'd all be looking at our phones at 11 o'clock at night and seeing who's, who's come back home. I'd have so much more data. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me, what did you find out about the differences between the two colonies? So I I didn't really compare the two colonies. People before me had studied colonies of farm cats that were intact, not neutered. And they found that rather than just congregations of feral cats around a food source, they actually had a social structure that they all based around the females and the matrilines and would all have their babies and communally nurse their kittens. And the whole social structure was based around these females. So the question was, when you neuter a colony, does that remove all the, you know, the need for social interaction and, you know, all that purpose? So I was trying to see whether neutered colonies still had some social life, if you like. And yes, they do, is the answer. So I found that the main thing I was looking at was how they use the 
different behavior patterns in day-to-day life. So the thing that I did find out was about tail positions and about how when one cat approaches another cat with its tail raised, that is usually an indication of a friendly intent. If they approached each other with their tail down, the outcome was a little bit more mixed. So that was sort of the start of finding out about tail up, as I call it. And yes, so that was one of the main findings, tail up. I also found that they never meowed to each other, my ferals. They just led their lives quite quietly. Lots of other things, but that was the main findings. Do you need expert help taming feral kittens for adoption? Watch the Taming Feral Kittens and Cats full-length workshop video now available for free on the Urban Cat League YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com and search Urban Cat League to see all of their videos to benefit community cats. In a recent study, 97% of respondents said that pets are family. Communities can play a vital role in helping to keep families together. Whether it's reuniting lost pets with their owners, donating pet supplies or funds for pet owners in need, or offering short or long-term fostering, people can help keep pets and their people together. We just have to show them how. Did you know there are resources you can use to help bring attention to the programs you offer to help them do just that? From public service announcements, short videos, printable posters, online and social graphics, and much more. Find your resources at www.petsandpeopletogether.org slash campaign dash resources. Hashtag be a helper. What if we presumed every stray cat who came to our shelters was a cherished pet with a loving home? How can we facilitate getting lost pets back to their owners without overwhelming current staff and volunteers or tying up space with long stray holds? Our brand new Return to Home Certification Workshop will help you leave all your preconceived notions about dumped, abandoned, or unwanted stray cats at the door. Join us on March 6th, and we'll show you simple, actionable ways that you can support owners of lost cats, be a resource for those who find cats, and increase the rate at which cats in our shelters are returned to their grateful families. Presented by Corinne Burgoyne, Shelter Operations Supervisor at Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, Attendees will receive a certificate after taking a short quiz and gain access to an ongoing Facebook group for networking. For more information or to sign up, visit communitycatspodcast.com slash get home. That's communitycatspodcast.com slash get home. One interesting statement that you said, it just fascinates me because I don't think we think about it that much. You were talking about how generations of cats over you know, generation and generation, they become more feral as they are out there. And you're nodding. And I believe in that. In here in the U.S., many organizations try to have a guideline and they say any kitten that comes into a clinic that's 16 weeks old or 12 weeks old, regard, you know, based on age, we're going to spay, neuter, ear tip, rabies vaccinated and release that cat. It's too old to be socialized. I believe that that is a very simplistic response to the situation because one 16-week-old kitten is not the same as another 16-week-old kitten born outside because if you're a third-generation feral kitten that's 16 weeks old, I could probably agree with you. I could even agree with you that it's a 10-week-old kitten if it's third-generation outdoor feral kitten, that that's going to be a hard kitten to socialize. But a 16-week-old from a mom cat that is loving and friendly and caring and just happened to be living outdoors and having her kittens, that kitten is going to learn different behaviors from mom than the multi-generational feral cat. So I think when we make these decisions in this gray area of age with regards to kittens as to who goes back and who goes and gets adopted, who goes to foster. We cannot use an age as being that determinant. What do you think about that? I agree. Obviously, technically, there's this sort of little small window of socialization between two to seven or eight weeks where, where if you don't catch them, you've missed it. And I think that that is true in some cases, but not in all cases. And definitely, I've seen cases where You've had an older feral come in and, I mean, not old, old, but, you know, still kidney and people have worked with them and they they have come round. And, you know, it's knowing, you never really know exactly what's happened in that window with a feral. I mean, they might have met a person, their mother might have, you know, introduced them to a person. And it's very, very much, I think it's very much has to be a case to case 
situation, I think you can't just say, well, this is the line and that's it. You're out there. And they might be out there, but they might not be. And like you say, if they're first generation, and and I use an example in my book, actually, about how a domestic cat can produce feral kittens very quickly. You know, if she lives, she becomes a stray and then she reproduces and then the kittens never see anyone, then those will become feral. But like you say, not as feral as the ginger cat that I had to deal with on the farm. He was truly feral and would never have lived with a person. But yeah, I agree with you. So, yeah, so you have mentioned that you have written a book, The Hidden Language of Cats, How They Have Us at Meow. Tell us why you decided you wanted to write a book and tell us what this is all about. So, well, sort of, as I said before, I think the main reason was that I felt that cats were given a bit of a harsh treatment in terms of being classed as aloof and not much to say for themselves. And Over the years, obviously, I've seen a lot of scientific literature come out, cat communication, and some of that's quite hard to access sometimes. And so I wanted to put it all together and make it hopefully a bit readable and make people look at their cats a bit more and maybe stand back and think, oh, gosh, that they're actually seeing this, hearing this, smelling this, and maybe think a bit more about how they interact with their cat, let the cat come to them, think about how whether the cat's still enjoying an interaction, how they're petting it, which part of the body they're petting, and maybe just look at cats, you know, from the cat's perspective a bit more. And that was where it all came from, really. So do you feel that historically, you know, you used a word, I think, earlier, aloof, you know, that cats have this reputation of not needing our interaction with them as maybe, obviously, with dogs. I mean, we inevitably Mm -hmm. end up, you know, comparing our cats with dogs. But I'm the first one to say that, you know, cats are not little dogs, right? They are not. And we need to approach our cats in a very different way. And, you know, back in the 90s, I would never have known what feline enrichment was. I would, you know, puzzle feeders, you know, things like that. I would never even have imagined that, you know, for our cats. But our cats have needs. They have desires and they have different ways of communicating with us. And Some people talk about it being pet detective, but I think of it more as just trying to, I don't know, connect in a different way than we might think. You know, many people say with, you know, you need to have a cat that you can, you know, hug and hold. And I've had many cats that I have not held until basically the day they passed away was the only day I was able to hold them. And I had a phenomenal relationship with that cat. We communicated in very different ways. There was vocal chirping, there's eye contact, there's body language. I had to learn their language. They weren't learning mine. And even my children, my son was, you know, six years old at the time. And they, my, my untouchable ferals, they were much closer to him physically than me. They gave me a wider berth. He didn't come with ownership baggage or something like that. And you think with children, cats would stay away from them. He had this innocence that they understood Mm -hmm. and they heard is so educational to learn a new language, you know, from our cats and from our pets and the no the cats that are like goldfish, but they move to room to room, you know, because they're pretty to look like, then they follow you around. They're engaged in a different way. Does this understanding of how to communicate with our cats, I would assume this elevates their status within our society, right? Yeah, I think so. I think what I want people to appreciate is how far cats have come because they come from a solitary ancestor, didn't need to communicate with each other apart from by scent to let each other know they'd passed by. And dogs came from wolves, which already had a full social set of behaviors. And, you know, they just used them with us and with each other. And and cats have had to uh, had to learn to speak to us. They've had to realize that we speak and that actually to get our attention, you know, you have to make a noise. And, you know, tail signals, rubbing, they use all these behaviors that they wouldn't have used, you know, in their ancestors never used. So I think that that in itself elevates them in our society. I think they're just remarkable creatures. And the way they adapt, you know, from the street to the house to the whatever we throw at them, they survive and they adapt and they keep on coming back to us. It's amazing, I think. I'm going to ask a question that gets asked by my father all the time. 
and he wants to know when will it be possible for us to speak directly to <laughs> or with cats? Well, who knows what AI is going to come up with, but I think it's quite a way off because we may be able to interpret certain things like, you know, what does that meow mean or what doesn't it mean? But there's so much subtle stuff going on. Unless we develop the cat's sense of smell or a cat's sense of hearing, I think there's well-kept secrets for a long time yet. Sorry to disappoint him. <laughs> I'll tell him he's going to have to be be patient. <laughs> He's fascinated by it. He just thinks it's an incredible topic to be able to speak with animals. And he knows that I have my podcast. And he said, you know, we need this. We need to be able to communicate with them, with the animals. Yeah. But there's lots of things we can do to communicate with them. We just have to pay more attention, I think. Well, you mentioned meowing. Mm. And I have seen several articles about the different types of meows. Is that valid information? Well, there's all sorts of stuff out there about meows. I think there's been quite a few scientific studies that show that it's quite hard to tell meows apart. For, it's easier if you're the owner of the cat, you start to develop a sort of a, a system between you. The cat you know, meows a certain way each time and you might be able to recognize it. It's quite hard. What we do know is that, that cats, domestic cats, meows have evolved to a much higher pitch than the sort of ancestral wild cats meow and that pitch pretty much exactly mimics how babies cries sound there's probably you know not a coincidence that they've got this wonderful meow that is particularly hard to ignore so that's really interesting i think that they know that that's the pitch to go for and weirdly we talk back to them in a little baby voice too most of the time which we call the ease so yeah there's some weird conversation going on there <laughs> well and it's obviously fascinating too how some cats will converse with us like we're having a regular conversation using their meows and then there are other cats that are quite silent quite silent yes they use other methods that they find more productive presumably with their tails or the rubs or eye contact maybe yep and tapping your face you know i had one who didn't talk long, much but He'd come up to me in the morning and he'd be like this. It'd be, I'm sorry, I'm tapping my face right now. He'd come up with a pun, you know, no words. It was just time to wake up and give me breakfast, <laughs> right? And that kind of thing. So again, it's learning to listen to what they're saying. Yes. And I think going back to the feral cat colonies is, you know, just sitting down and observing. And unfortunately, our volunteers, our caregivers, our society is just so overwhelmed and stressed that it's hard. You're running around, you're feeding your cat colonies. You've got to go on to the next one or you're trying to check a trap. Yeah. Or you're trying, But at some point in time, it's really nice if you could just sit down and just watch them. I was so privileged to just sit on a farm and, and watch them. A pair of binoculars, you know, notebook and pen <laughs> and my tape recorder now and again. And that's how it was. It just doesn't really happen these days. But I wish people could experience that because there is so much to see right. what they're doing. And understand the, the learn, the, the family, the ecosystem and the playfulness. Cats, they hunt, but they play too. Yes, even ferals. Yeah. Oh, ferals <laughs> yeah. play a lot. <laughs> yeah. They play a lot. I had a feral who broke out of my house and she actually joined a turkey family in our backyard. She lived outside for about three months and there was mama turkey Baby turkey, baby turkey, baby turkey, baby turkey, baby turkey. Kachina, my cat, at the end of all babies. And she was just part of that family for like two or three months. And then we got her back into the house because her companion cat, who was much older than she was, was not doing well. And so she came back in the house to be with him. But she was having a grand old time with that turkey family. She just loved it. <laughs> Just to see, you know, story. I like that. it just, there's excitement, wonder, discovery, challenge. There's so many emotions that cats feel, you know, inside and outside, just from within their soul that they need to express all the way through. So Sarah, I want to thank you for bringing, you know, these stories forward. If people are interested in checking out your book, how would they do that? Yeah. So it's called The Hidden Language of Cats, How They Have Us at Me Out. Is published by Dutton in the US. And I'm on Instagrams, Dr. Sarah Brown, or I'm on LinkedIn if people want to connect. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? No, really, just watch your cat. 
sit, take five minutes a day to just sit and watch and listen and enjoy your cat, I think is my big message. I agree with you 100%. Turn that Calm app off on your <laughs> yes. phone. You know, watching the cats is better than any other sort of meditation app that you might have or meditation training. And we have so many things. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. Just sit down, watch, enjoy your cats. They'll always surprise you with something. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to talk to you. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening. And thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.